Welcome to another day in the clouds with the Clifton Journal. Today is going to be a little talk about Stephen King's The Drawing of the Three. This is book two of the Dark Tower epic fantasy series, which is epic um, and fantasy, but it doesn't feel like epic fantasy, uh, which is both good and bad. All right, so, um, and I think I've, quick, quick little segue here, I think I've kind of cemented um, down what I'm going to be doing for the Clifton Journal. I think uh, we are going to be having essentially three components. There will be days talking about writing craft. There will be days talking about geekery, um, such as this, um, book reviews, movie reviews, etc. Um, perhaps computer-related things too, but um, probably not so much. Okay, anyway, and then uh, third would be kind of a mixture of the first two. Uh, this would be talking about my own work, um, in which I, case I get to um, geek out about it, and we'll probably um, <clears throat> uh, make mention of some craft in the um, in the uh, in the interior. Okay, so moving on. Um, Let's also touch base real quick on my progress for Kip the Quick, book two, Kip's Return. Um, so it's going along. Um, I'm working through Irwell's um, point of view, which uh, you will learn all about once the book is all done, of course. And this it's really starting to flesh out. Um, don't think I'll be on his point of view for too much longer before I get to jump back into um, the main storyline and um, start to, to really start to pull things together here. Um, I feel like I've said this many times before, it means little to you who is not in my head, who is not looking at what I've done, of course. So why am I even bothering? I don't know. I'm excited. I just want to talk about it. So there. Um, I'm at 99,000 words. Take one down, pass it around. Um, won't be doing any cutting for a while though yet. So, all right, that's where I'm at. Uh, oh, and book cover number three is done. Oh, it looks fabulous. Uh, my favorite though is book two, cover, you'll see. All right, now let's dive into Stephen King's The Drawing of the Three. So this is a really, this is an interesting series. Um, thank you to my friend Scott for recommending it. Um, I've, I've particularly enjoyed listening to the audiobook. I believe the narrator for book two is Frank Mueller, yep, something like that. He does great voices. I mean, this guy is, uh, uh, I, have to, I have to geek out over him for a moment because, I mean, he's, He's whipping out some accents for some some Irish brogue. Is that what they call it? Um, uh, we got like kind of the the Western gunslinger gravelly voice. We've got uh, New Yorker. Uh, we've got uh, an old um, uh, tired Jew um, accent. Uh, 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 multiple different ladies. One is um, extremely vile. The other one is extremely sophisticated. Uh, and he does them all with aplomb. I mean, and he just switches back and forth without this. This guy, this guy has to do cartoons or something like that. He, he might have, he might have given um, some of the the late greats, uh, Warner Butter cartoon vocalists, uh, a run for their money. Anyway, so very good narration. Uh, I don't know how good book one was. I'm just picking up the audio book for book two. So. This this really skates like the literary um, this book, which which is fun, um, but it's also kind of one of the, the my my one niggling point about the stories thus far um, is that there's a lot of stuff that's kind of unexplained. There's a lot of mystery. There's a lot of um, unanswered questions. Um, things change sort of. But um, there's enough mystery to kind of uh, 
support that it all works. There's times where, you're, you know, you read and you kind of think, hmm, I wonder, does that really all add up? But, you know, there's such a mystery to the tomb that, you know, it, it's, it's just, I don't know, it's very interesting. And, and it, this is going to take me on a little segue here. I'm going to try to come back to in a second. Um, but let's see first about the book. Um, so the characters are all very, very deeply, I mean, yeah, you just get really deep into the character with Stephen King here. Um, I'm not a big Stephen King fan. Uh, I think I got scared a little too much when I was a kid reading it. Um, and I kind of stopped at that. Uh, I may have read The Stand, or maybe I'm just thinking of watching The Stand. Either way, um, this is mostly, I think, my, 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 my only other experience with Stephen King. So, um, you get really deep into the character, uh, which is also kind of a detriment. Sometimes you kind of want to just move on. But um, there is kind of this handy dandy little tool on the audiobook where you can go at um, 120% speed and that kind of helps things a little. Um, which is, is partly due to the narrator. He is, um, he is a slow reader, but he does, except for of course the vile woman who talks like a mile a minute and uh, it's 100% obscenity. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but otherwise, you know, he's, he's speaking with great enunciation. I mean, it, it, it just really works. Like, it's not like it doesn't, it doesn't pull down the experience. Um, it's just that since he is so clear in his speech, I, I can speed it up to 120%. So, I don't know. Maybe that gets it to a little bit closer to um, reading speed versus, um, you know, audiobook speed for consumption. So, characters are great. Um, the setting, the setting is very interesting. So I'm, I'm going to have some spoilers. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Um, this book's been out for a long time, so you have no excuses, really. And uh, so, if this is really an issue, stop now. Check out the book and come on back. Um, but I will try to We'll try to keep it to minimal spoileriness, okay? More talking about around the outskirts of things. Okay, so the world of the gunslinger is like a future dystopia where all of the modern conveniences of man has, has started to, you know, topple into decay. And there are alluded um, there are allusions to some sort of event or events that transpired to cause this. So the world is in a state of decline. So, okay, but, but, but the, uh, this story does not take place solely in the world of the gunslinger. It takes place in an alternate world, an alternate time. Um, there are a series of three doors through which the gunslinger is able to step in a manner of speaking um, and make acquaintance with other people, uh, some of which will join him on his journey. Uh, and when I say join, I don't necessarily mean that they want to. This is, um, so we're, we're marrying a little bit of the past and the kind of present day style venues. Um, I, I guess this kind of, this worked for me and didn't work for me. It, it clashed with my sense of expectation. I, I wanted to, I was expecting, sorry, I was expecting to be in this kind of um, Western, you know, um, I guess 18th century, you know, U.S. desolate, like, kind of landscape. I was kind of expecting that. And then we keep popping into um, not current era. It's a little, little bit in the past, but, um, you know, uh, mid to late 20th century. Um, 
U.S. and and uh, so it's it's a bit I guess I don't know about jarring, but it just um, it wasn't expected, but it becomes very interesting, and so in that regard. You know, you don't typically, as a, a reader, as much as you think you might sometimes, you don't typically want to read something you know all about. You want to read something to be surprised, to learn, to think. Uh, and this definitely accomplishes that. So, again, setting. Interesting detail. Um, what else can I say about the drawing of the three? Well... All right, I, I think I'll move on to my next point that I wanted to bring up about it, which is in relation to just the way the story's written. Like I said before, there's a lot of there's a lot of mystery in this work of Stephen King. There's a lot of things that are unanswered. And on the surface, as a writer, I, I look at it and I think, hmm, shouldn't this bother me as a reader? Shouldn't I read it and say, hey, he didn't answer that. Hey, he's, this, this seems like too surface level. Like, I want, I want more info, you know. Um, or maybe not surface level is the right way to say it. But just like something happened that was kind of amazing, mysterious, strange. And I don't know how. I don't know why. There's nothing in the book that says this shouldn't happen. Um, in fact, there's many things in the book thus far because it is a bit of an, it's an odd story. It's a strange story. Because of all this, you know, you, you do start to come to kind of expect this stuff. And yet, you are still surprised. So I just kind of wonder, in terms of the enjoyment level here, and I, I think to other books, is this something, I guess we're going into a craft moment here, sorry, uh, it was supposed to be just geekery. Um, so there's this mystery, and I just kind of wonder. I mean, dark the Dark Tower series is uh, you know well regarded, you know well read, etc. Um, a lot of fans. I I just wonder, like, is this kind of a component that you really want to have? Uh, I listen to the writing excuses a lot. They talk about the, let's see, what they call the mar the marriage of the familiar and the strange, um, make things surprising yet inevitable. Um, so it kind of goes along with that, but at the same time, I guess initially, as a writer, when I'm thinking about plotting up my story, I'm thinking that okay, you know, here's a hundred questions that will be posed. Uh, Ninety of them will be answered, right? Maybe like, you know, a, a good chunk. But in here, I think there's a lot more that go unanswered. Um, some that are fairly significant. So, um, how, why does that work? And in that question, I think, okay, do other books do this? Well, yes, definitely. Let's look at Game of Thrones. Um, magic is not really talked about in detail there at all. Um, there is the, the Red Lady. I forget her name exactly, but she's the uh, the Red God. She's like a priestess of the Red God. She serves um, Stannis um, in his war. She does things that just, you know, well, they're not explained. <laughs> um, and there's, mm, let's see, what else? Okay, you've got, you've got Gandalf, for instance, in Lord of the Rings. Um, he can't often be you know, around. Um, he has other important things to do, so it's kind of like loosely explained, but but not. Um, he, his powers themselves are, are not really well explained. It seems like he can do this, then he can do that, then things change, and you know. Um, I, I guess in some respects, these things seem kind of primal. Like just, I mean, you can't quantify it or get down into a science, you know, it, it's it's beyond and above our, or below, our comprehension. 
Um, what else? Uh, some of the, I think the most talked about storyline plot lines um, with with the um, Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan. Some of the most talked about ones were never answered definitively. It was essentially just you know fodder for the message boards to discuss and decipher. So. These were all big series. Um, I, I can't create a rule here, I don't think. Um, I think in these instances in general, these books have a, a sense of mystery. Wheel of Time maybe a little bit less so. It's a little bit more obvious in a lot of regards. It talks about a lot of things. It reveals a lot of things, sorry. But the other ones, they, they tend to have more, and they have there's this mystery component to them. They're kind of... It's like this rich tapestry that that um, that you just love to view, but you don't, you can't really describe it. It's just like it's colors beyond your comprehension. It's um, shapes and patterns that you can't describe, but you know they're there. Um, other books, you know, like um, I, I would say probably, a, so let's say Brandon Sanderson's books. They tend to be a little bit more, um, I'm lacking a word, this doesn't sound right, but blunt, shall we say. Um, there is, he does leave some mysteries, I know that because he's a talented writer, he knows, he knows, he knows the art form. Um, but it just seems in my retrospect from the few I've read of his, not which I certainly have not read all of them, so I could be wrong in some, but it seems like they're a little bit more just out there. So, so I guess I'm not really proving anything here. What one thing I was I was kind of noodling around in my head was, does having a greater sense of mystery, um, does it create for better storytelling? Does it create better memories with the reader? Um, I don't think there's any way to prove it wrong or right, but I will say that um, it. It makes me think that when you have these kind of mysteries, these unexplained things happening, on, happening um, as long as you somehow make them, make them somehow, I don't know, viable, you, you've given color to the world, so it just seems like, okay, yeah, this kind of does make sense. It doesn't, but it does. Oh, I can't explain it any better, but anyway, so, in, in having these elements, you know, do you as the reader have to contemplate them more? Does it just kind of cause this, this, this mental conflict where you're trying to decipher something and, and create meaning from something? And that extra mental energy almost seems as if it would involve the reader into the story more and thereby making it almost interactive and almost potentially more enjoyable. This is just a theory. Um, I'm pretty sure I could say without doubt that a story that answered 100% of all the questions it posed would not be nearly as good as something that did not. And I think most writers know to hold something back here and there. Um, this also goes along with um, with over-explaining, which is essentially, well, which can be info-dumping, but it doesn't necessarily have to be info-dumping, of course, what is more or less about, okay, gotta give you a bunch of information, boom, here it is. Well, I mean, you could also over-explain. It doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of information in one spot. It could just be over and over and over again, such as this person is depressed. This person is sad. This person is this. This person is that. You keep going back to it over and over and over again, as you, and, and you as the reader are like, I get it. I get it. They're annoying. There's, they're, in a, they're in a bit of apathy here, you know. Um, for my wife and I, we ran into these uh, points a lot with uh, the Bella character in Twilight series. Um, 
So, yeah, that's just as a thought, you know, food for thoughts. And um, I'm going to call it there because I've been talking a long time. I have nothing else really more to say of quantitative value. So, bye bye Wait, don't go. I didn't finish. I wandered off into the weeds as I followed Stephen King's meandering path and got lost. But I have something else to add. But first, just a note that Kip's return update is from 2016, just so you don't get confused. Now, how does King get away with leaving so many questions unanswered? I mentioned that the very act of leaving some questions unanswered may lead to increased engagement and enjoyment, but there's more. I think he pulled it off in large part because he created strong, well-developed characters. And since the characters themselves were mystified and unclear by what transpired, the reader is, is assured that they also don't yet need to know. Time will bring revelation, hopefully. But King also provides a clear conflict. Some questions are answered, and in the end, we have a satisfying resolution, even though it only opens up one huge door full of more questions. What's your thought as to why it worked? Or didn't? Thanks for listening, dear reader. Visit www.cliftonh.com subscribe to my newsletter and read my books reading is awesome